Shalom, Erev Tov, good evening from Jerusalem, Israel. This is Lowell Joseph Gallen, founder of the Root and Branch Association Limited, established in 1981 in New York State in God of Israel, Bless America, and now celebrating our 40th anniversary. I would like to welcome our viewers and listeners worldwide and our live Zoom studio audience to this evening's program in our Root and Branch Association Limited English Language Conference and Lecture Series broadcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. And now celebrating the start of our second quarter century, our second 25 years. As I always do at the beginning of each program, Hakarat Tatov, recognizing the good, we thank our hosts for the first 25 years from January 1995 until December 2020, the Orthodox Union of America Israel Center, 22 Karen Hyassad Street, gave us a welcome home to start from nothing and build up to where we are today. And especially we wanna thank the Educational Director Emeritus and Founder and Editor Emeritus of the remarkable Torah Tidbits publication Mr. Phil Chernovsky, his wife, his Ashid Chayel, woman of valor, Mrs. Tony Chernovsky, and the long suffering Mrs. Itta Rachel Rusick, the scheduler who keeps all the trains coming in and out of Grand Central Station over there. I don't know how she does it. I would have been carried on a stretcher a long time ago. Thank you to all of you. Now, today is Wednesday, June 16th, 2021, in the Gregorian calendar, and the sixth day of Tammuz 5781 in the Hebrew Israelite calendar. We like to give historical context uh, what happened around this time some years ago on May 16th. I was wrong, I was saying May 19th. May 16th, 1943, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising against the Nazis came to an end. On June 5th, 1967, the miraculous Six-Day War began here in the land of Israel. And on June 6th, 1944, Allied armies, primarily American, Canadian, and British, landed at Omaha and other beaches in Normandy to begin the liberation of France and Europe from Nazi Germany. We are here today because of sacrifices made then, so we should always remember them. Now we are broadcasting from the land of Israel, city of God, Jerusalem, hill of the priests, Givat Hanania, Abu Tor, overlooking Mount Moriah, where we believe that the third and final Israelite temple of Jerusalem will soon be under reconstruction and stand forever as per the prophet Ezekiel's vision. Please see the biblical book of Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. The Root and Branch Association promotes faith in the God of Israel who created us all, a study and practice of universal Jewish teachings within the framework of the Noahide Covenant and Laws. Please see Genesis chapter 9. If you are Christian, please also see the book of Acts chapter 15. And for all to honor God's land, Torah, and people covenants with his chosen people, Israel. And by Israel, we mean all 12 tribes who are in the process, we hope, of reuniting worldwide soon. Our speaker for this evening's program is old friend, Mr. Yair Davidi, who will speak on the lost tribes of Israel and Scandinavia. Yair is a prolific researcher, writer, and speaker who founded the Brit Am and Hebrew Nations Organization. He'll get a proper introduction later when our program chair, Dr. Les Glassman, arrives home from his dental clinic. If you need a crown or a root canal or periodontia, whatever you need, new teeth, new mouth, go see Les in Jerusalem. He'll take care of you. And as we always do, we thank our friend Zorba the Jew, Professor Ashram Natathias, born in a cave in Nazi-occupied Greece in 1943, who hosts our monthly Greek Jewry Through the Ages seminar 
And we are privileged that on many of our programs, Professor Matathias can join us as a panelist from the five towns in Long Island. Now, without further ado, but oh, two more points. One is I always dedicate each program now in memory and honor of another panelist who is with us, though you can't see him, Lieutenant Colonel Martin Gallen, my father, whose body returned to the earth and whose soul returned to the heavens on October 16th, 2018, the age of 98. He was in ROTC at City College in the 1930s. In 1942, entered active service, the United States Army as Lieutenant, European Theater, concluded the war as a captain, and then joined the Army Reserve and retired as Lieutenant Colonel. My father was buried with full military honors by United States Army Honor Guard in Westchester County in our, on October 16, 2018. He is with us here today. And in terms of prophetic time, this ancient Israelite autist believes that it is the 95th day of the second year of the regenerating fifth Israelite monarchy of Daniel's vision, please see the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 44, which he believes began on Rosh Chodesh Nisan one year and three months ago. So without further ado, I will introduce our speaker, Mr. Davidi, and later Dr. Glassman will give him a proper, more in-depth introduction. Yeah, here I'm handing this over to you thank you so much shalom uh shalom Ari. Hello. Uh, how are you i'm here uh so um you're interested in the lost in tribes in scandinavia so we uh analyze the question of lost in tribes where did the lost in tribes go to originally you had Hebrews came out of Egypt. They were on, uh, we had Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. Jacob was reigning on Israel. There were 12 sons, uh, gave rise to 12 tribes, actually 13, because the tribe of Joseph was divided into two Ephraim and Manasseh. The, the Bible, the Tanakh, always uh, maintains a quorum of 12 by either counting uh, Ephraim and Manasseh as one tribe of Joseph or Counting both Ephraim and Manasseh separate tribes, but uh, not counting uh, Levi. But nevertheless, uh, technically there were two, uh, 13 tribes of Israel. The, uh, the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were in the, in, the, in the wilderness, they received the Torah, they came into the land of Canaan and they conquered it and settled in it. At the beginning they were ruled by a, a series of judges, leaders, uh, charismatic leaders one could say, inspired uh, holy people. After that came the period of the kings. The first king was King Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. Then David and Solomon. Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. After Solomon came Rehavam, Rehavam. In English transliteration, Rehavam, the time of Rehavam, 10 of the, of the tribes separated. They set up their own kingdom in the north. It was by Jeroboam, Yeravam in Hebrew. He set up his own, his own entity actually containing numerically, demographically, the, the, the bulk of the Hebrew peoples at uh, that time. And uh, so they continued as two separate nations, one alongside the other. At times they fought with each other, at times they cooperated in different ways. But nevertheless, they were separate uh, and they went their separate, separate ways. After about uh, almost 200 years, the Assyrians conquered the Northern Kingdom of Israel and they took all of the 10 tribes into exile. They took uh, a portion of them, or most of them, overland into the regions of the Assyrian Empire. Others, they settled in their colonies overseas using uh, Phoenicians, that is, uh, people, uh, Canaanites, from the cities of Tyre and Sidon, and also uh, Philistines, who uh, identified, uh, according to archaeological findings, with, with Mycenaean Greek or Min Owen from Crete. Findings, actually, the Philistines were also participants of that culture. So they do help the Assyrians to settle people overseas. So we had two pathways of the divisions of the of the Israelite nation, of those exiles who were taken away. And uh, all of, incidentally, all of the Northern Kingdom was taken. 
the ninety percent of the northern kingdom was was destroyed, was burnt. All the cities were burned. According to archaeological evidence, that proves this, and the people disappeared almost altogether. Uh, there were some remnants got to Jerusalem, got to which increased at that stage of the stage of destruction of the northern kingdom. Its population increased actually in what is now the Jewish quarter. Received an influx of population of refugees from the northern tribes. Nevertheless, this was only a small minority, and most of the Israelites were exiled. And not only were most of the northern Israelites from the ten tribes were exiled, but also a good portion of Jews from the kingdom of Judah when Sanaharib, Sanherib invaded Jerusalem shortly after he had taken away the lost ten tribes have been the ten ten tribes have been taken away. Also, Judah was invaded. A good portion of Judah was also taken. They joined up. The ten tribes in their places of exile, and they accounted as part of them. Nahmanides, in his book of uh, Redemption, Sefer Guli, speaks of this at length, and he tells us how, how the Bible looks at things, how we look at things, how we to consider things. Uh, so the main bulk of the ten tribes were taken into exile. They went to different portions of the Assyrian Empire, and uh, after permutations, different overthrows of kingdoms, and joining and uh, becoming independent of the Assyrians. And joining up other peoples, and they moved. They moved to the north. They moved to the north. Moved. Uh, to, they were already close. Many of them had already been settled close to the Caucasus region, regions. They moved north of the Caucasus. From there, they moved northward, and uh, they entered Scandinavia. Others of them had been taken by the uh, proxies of the Assyrians to Spain, to uh, portions of, uh, of Britain, also possibly to Scandinavia itself. And at that time, the climate was different. Scandinavia enjoyed a Mediterranean type of climate, and uh, the cultivation of the soil continued much further north than it does at present. And archaeologists have found uh, the Bronze Age Scandinavia. The Bronze Age Scandinavia was connected with the Mediterranean area. They found uh, findings, they find uh, relics, they find uh, uh, types of furniture, similar to those of Egypt, similar to those of McKinney and Greece. Similar to those of the Phoenicians, also in some way similar to those of Israel, and this is accepted. This is uh, incidentally, this is not some uh, some uh, hidush. It's not a new finding that we are jump uh, putting on people, placing before people. It is known. It's, this is known. It's in, uh, in Scandinavia. It's accepted in uh, academic uh, circles. I have a book here. Uh, a lot of books here. But one of these books. This is um. The Rise of Bronze Age Society, it's an academic work, it's accepted in academic circles, and he describes it with a full of illustrations what happened in Bronze Age Sweden and uh, Scandinavia in general, where they had a lot of um, a lot of findings which that are identical with those of the Middle East and the Near East area. So it is, it is accepted that culturally Bronze Age Sweden had an influx, an ethnic influx of newcomers from the Middle East area. So logistically, to say that the, a portion of them or a good, a good number of them were from Israel is not logistically improbable. It is not because others were there or people from the, bearing a similar type of culture were there and this is accepted. Uh, and the, the lost tribes of Israel, these tribes, they meet not only in Scandinavia, but also in other, a good portion of, of Western Europe, in, in the Netherlands, in, in France, in Switzerland, you find uh, evidence of Israelites being there, also in the British Isles, in Ireland, in throughout that Scotland, in England, Wales, we find evidence of Israelites having been there, and the Scandinavian, uh, Scandinavian, Input there's going to be in contact, participation. Participation in this is what, what I said is that a participation of one portion of Israelite tribes which Scandinavia. And we have a lot of proofs of this from all different ways. In general, the Bible says that the lost tribes will be in the north, in the northern land of Israel, will be to the north and the west, there will be isles of the sea or in peninsulas. And uh, they would uh, be in areas that are associated with Western Europe. And we find uh, amongst these the peoples who populated Scandinavia, incidentally, Scandinavia went through a lot of uh, a lot of changes. 
what I just told you about Bronze Age Scandinavia being connected to the Middle East, that is conventionally dated to uh, long before the Lost Times were exiled. So that is where we differ with the conventional uh, academic findings. We say that the dates should be much lower than they place them. But apart from that, they agree with us. So too the dolmens, they agree that the dolmens and megalithic monuments uh, show a pathway of migration from the Middle East area, from the area of ancient Israel. They go through, through the Caucasus region in, into uh, Bulgaria, to Southeast Europe, and then go up into Scandinavia, or across the sea to the, to the British Isles and along the coast. This is also agreed upon, but the dates they place uh, begin much, much, much long before the Lost Tribes were exiled, according to the conventional understanding, but we disagree with the, with the dating. We, all, we find the traces of, of Israelites in Scandinavia. We're not saying that the Scandinavians are all descended from Hebrews. We are saying that the, the, the Scan there was a portion of some lost tribes in Scandinavia. A portion of the people do descend from Israelites. And the, the, the Israelites there did have an influence upon the ca national characteristics of the people there. And so it could be that a good portion of the people are, 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 descend are of Israelite descent. Now, uh, what portion exactly it, it pertains to, we cannot say. But we can say that historically it has a, an influence and it is there to see and it can be proven. Uh, we'll take, uh, I'll give you, an, uh, for example, Sweden. We identify Sweden with the tribe of Gad. Sweden was uh, founded, the country of Sweden was founded when the Goths, the Goths, uh, the Goths and the Swear people known as the Swear joined together. They, they, it had been divided into two parts. The Swear, also known as the Suoni, according to, to Dakitas, the Roman historian, and, and the Goths, or the Guti, also known as Guti. And they joined, when they joined together, they created the country of Sweden, okay? So the Goths were an important element within this, the formation of Sweden. The very name of Goth in Hebrew, in ancient Hebrew, biblical Hebrew could be pronounced as Gad. We have the, 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 the O sound in Goth in Gad, in uh, Temanit, the Temanim, also a uh, type of Hebrew, pronounced Hebrew similar to it as it was in biblical times. So they would have pronounced it Gad as Goth or something similar. A D without a, an accent it could have been pronounced as a Tha. So we have Goths being the, pronounced the same way, another for, form of pronunciation of the word Gad. And also in Gothic place names in Sweden, we often find it pronounced as Gad. So not only could uh, Goth be another uh, pronunciation of Gad, but Goth was all, uh, Gad was another pronunciation for Goth. So we have a direct one-on-one, -on -one, According to the names identification, the Sweons, uh, uh, Swear also known as Sweon. So the firstborn son of Gad was Shuon. And it's uh, in the northern tribes, where in the words that we pronounce as Shin, they often pronounce as Sa. Without the SH sound, we also find Shibolot, Shibolot, the famous story in the Bible, where they, where they wanted to, to determine who is from the tribe of Ephraim, asked him to, to say Shibolot. Instead of saying Shibolot, it was a Sibolot. And so we find this too. So the Suya, the Suyans, uh, have also the same name as as Shuwani, a son of, 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 son of God. Another son of God was Harodi, Harodi. And he had the Harudi, or the Harudi, Harudi Goths. The important in Scandinavia had the same name. Also, they had the Haarali, the son of Gad, of Gad. And the Harudi was an important element people in Scandinavia associated with the Goths. And we have uh, the, we also have a, uh, we use, we use a lot of different sources. So one of the sources we use, just a second, is, uh, Rabbinical sources. We use rabbinical sources. Uh, this is this book, a very good book by Fisher Fisher Ma'ail, in uh, Shifta Yisrael. He goes into the characteristics, the personality characteristics of each of the tribes. According to biblical sources and rabbinical commentators. See, it has nothing to do with us. 
he knows about us, so you spoke to him, to him on the phone, but he worked entirely without any knowledge of us, without any idea of who the, of those 10 tribes whatsoever. Just, he was quite interested in him. He was the personality of each of the different tribes, according to the sources, and uh, how, how the sources describe them. So he says about God, uh, God Gad. Gad, uh, as uh, the word Gad, the name Gad has several different connotations. One of them is connected to Gudud. Gad Gadud ye Gudeno, and when the Jacob gave the name Gad to to his son, or when the name Gad was given to to Gad, it was a Gadud Gudeno. It's associated with the word Gadud, meaning group of people. Or and he and according to Fisher Mael, uh, the characteristic of Gad is to to be concerned with the group, the individual functioning as part of a group. Not standing out, but work, a group working together. And this is, uh, of all the peoples on earth, the Swedes have this characteristic. The Swedes are known of this. No man left behind. The Swedes don't like people taking charge. They like to sit around and decide things. To do things as, as groups, as a group of people. And they succeed in it. And they look after each other. They have a, a concept of social welfare, communal social welfare that everyone is looked after, but everyone gives and it works for them because the people that also have this consciousness to work for the group, to do what the group needs and to be part of it. And they don't like people uh, putting themselves outside of the group or not working in tandem with the group. And this, according so this, according to the the characteristic of God, is a character, tribal characteristic of God. This would be found them amongst the Swedes, and we find tribal names connected with God amongst uh, peoples who comprise the Swedish nation. And we had a, a had a, in Scandinavia itself, we had a, the relationship to the Jews was. Uh, was not as good as it should have been at all times, but we had uh, exceptional people who helped, who did things. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg, who saved a lot of Jews in Hungary, was sent by the Swedish government to do that, and this is what he did. Also, the Swedes were neutral in, t in the Second World War, but they helped the Allies. Uh, they were in a difficult position and helped the Allies much more than they helped the Nazis. The Merchant Marine, the least the Merchant Marine were 8,000 sailors to the British, to the Allies, and that was working for them. And the Germans couldn't do much about it. Goebbels, when Goebbels, the, the, the Nazi propaganda minister, when he came to visit Sweden, he, he saw the people and he felt contempt for them. They, they, he said they're blonde on the outside and half Jewish on the inside. So they, this, this element was recognized. We, the enemies of this lot of people recognized this element. This is a Hebrew element within the Swedish nation. Uh, and so too, we have the, the Norwegians, the Norwegians, we have the Norwegians, the Norwegians, we relate Norwegians to the tribe of Naphtali. We had the Naphtalite Huns, the Naphtalite Huns were a people in Central Asia. That was their name, they were known as, as the Naphtali or Naphtalites, Naphtalites, the White Huns is another name given to them because they were associated with the Huns, but they were white as distinct from the Huns who were somewhat um, intermixed with Chinese people and so on, or similar to them. So the Naphtalite Huns in about the 500, 600 CE, they invaded Norway. There were already people living in Norway who were similar to them. Uh, and uh, But they, they came into Norway, invaded Norway, took it over, they were much more numerous than the native inhabitants. They, they didn't drive the other people out, but they intermixed with them and settled alongside them. And the demographic weight of all these newcomers coming in drove the uh, Norwegians and also the Danes, also the same happened in Denmark, drove the Norwegians and the Danes and also a portion of the Swedes to, to, uh, to indulge in overseas incursions, excursions that gave us the Vikings. The Vikings who invaded, who invaded uh, Ireland, invaded England, the British Isles, Scotland, uh, England. They invaded uh, France, they created the, the, the state of Normandy was created by, uh, by Rollo, by a Viking group. And from Normandy, they conquered England and they gave us Norman civilization, which was quite advanced. So historically, they were important. And so that, they, what, they, what was their name? Uh, uh, Naphtali, they named after Naphtali. Sealand, Sealand uh, was one of the, was the son of, of, um, 
Naftali. And Naftali has some different uh, characteristics. And Naftali was uh, uh, Naftali was uh, was just described as a hind, a female deer. A female deer. So the commentator said, why was described why was Naftali described as a female deer? Because he was fast. He was quick. I had alacrity and and uh, he was a uh, and it is faster than the male. So Naftali was called after the female deer. But uh, you also see another point. Uh, incidentally, all of the tribes, each one of the tribes had, according to the Midrash, had an animal symbol. They had their, they had their, their main as a symbol, an ordinary symbol. And they also had an animal as a symbol. We know six or seven of the symbols, not done not all of them, but the Midrash says that each and every one of them had had this, and the, the, this animal symbol of Naftali was a female deer. And uh, so it's, uh, and the, uh, incidentally, the Norwegians are quite masculine. They're, they're not a city type of people. They're quite masculine, outgoing, physically uh, impressive, as a lot of Scandinavians are. But they are named after, their symbol was a female deer, and they also have this feminine aspect there. One could say they're conscious of their female side, and they have um, been, been the foremost promoter of women's rights, for better or for worse in the world. They also, uh, in their foreign aid, they try and uh, encourage the, the granting of what, uh, recognition of women's rights in foreign countries. Uh, very big on that. About half of the, more than half of their members of parliament, or mem not members of parliament, of their prime ministers have been women. Iceland is uh, an island uh, off the coast of Norway. It belongs to Norway. It is partially Norwegian. It is has it's independent, but it's associated strongly associated with Norway. And in Iceland, you find this aspect of women, a women's participation, even more pronounced than in Norway. But both Norway and Iceland are known for this as something which they're known about. It's interesting that the animal female symbol was was a female was a female deer. In other words, they were, uh, they gave uh, most nations, most people consider themselves a warrior people, uh, uh, masculine and macho type, that is the, the, an ideal that many people have, their own type. And so they prefer a, a male animal. But uh, Naftali accepted that actually, possibly chose a female deer. So this is an aspect of Naftali we we find in Norway. We also find uh, in Den in Denmark we have the Danes, the Danes and the very name Danes. And they call themselves Dan, and their ancestor was Dan the Great. Dan the Great was the son of someone called uh, humble, humility, and uh, the name Jakob Konosis. Jakob is named after Aker, but it also has a, has a connotation of 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 humility. So the father of of Dan was of Dan the Great in in in, in uh, Danish mythology was named Humble, and Dan the Great uh, was uh, gave rise to the Danish people, according to what they themselves say say that they named after Dan. There was have legends and traditions that not everyone recognizes, but have a, a ancient go back way to the early Middle Ages at least that they are descended from Israel. They, they, there were also the Jutes living there. The Jutes were, uh, they were, have the same name given, Jutes, given to Jews. And the Jutes were a portion of Judah associated with Dan, Dan in, the, in, the, in biblical times. He was, a, he was a neighbor of, he was a neighbor of Dan. He was a neighbor of uh, Dan and uh, Dan and, and uh, entities from Judah throughout their peregrinations, throughout their migrations before they got to Denmark often associated together different point groups from Judah together with people from Dan. Incidentally, getting back to Norway, another thing about Norway is that when the Norway, Naftali, was in the land of Israel, he was settled along the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of, the sea of Galilee. Again, the Sea of Galilee, which is actually a, an, uh, a canoeret. It's actually a, a, a large lake of fresh water. It's quite large now, and it, it contains a, a good portion of Israel's water resources, reserves. In the past, it was much bigger than it now is. Even now, there are people who fish there. In the past, the fishing was much more important. 
and the valley was settled along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, along the shores of Canera. All along the shore, the western shore was uh, Naphtali. Naphtali was settled there, and Naphtali had their little farms along the coast, and he engaged in fishing. When the Naphtalite Huns came to Norway, they did the same. They settled along the coast, and guess what? They engaged in fishing. And how do they engage in fishing? Because the herring. Even now, Naphtali is, the Norwegians are famous for herring. In the past, in the herring season, uh, masses of herring migrate up there in order to breed. And uh, there were times when you could dip your hand in the, in the sea water and pull out a bundle of fish of, of tasty, large herring. Swarms and swarms of them. Now it's changed, and not so the 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 the, 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 the tidal waves or the, the pathways or the tides have changed. Current sea currents have changed. There's been a global uh, changes in, in climate, and geography, and then too the same thing was happening. So before the Naphtalites came to Norway, the herring were going elsewhere, maybe to England, maybe along the coast of Western Europe somewhere. When the Naphtalites came about the same time. The sea currents changed and brought all the herring up there. In other words, we had, used to have a joke. We used to have a joke in Israel when the Jews, when the Jews from Russia, Jews from Russia started coming to Israel in the great masses. Where it was a couple of, one or two years when hundreds of thousands of them were coming every day, or were coming, or a lot of them were coming all the time. See on the streets, new Russians coming. And at that day, and that time, it was snowing. It was snowing in Israel. So it doesn't snow every year in Israel. It was snowing quite heavily, and this happens once every couple of years. So we used to have the joke to say to the Russian immigrants that they brought the snow with them from Russia. So he could have said the same thing about Naphtali. When Naphtali got up to Norway, he brought the fish with him. And uh, another in another thing of interest, possibly of possible interest, is that today the uh, Norwegian economy is based uh, a major a major, major provider of sustenance to the Norwegians. Now, Norwegian economy is quite good. And people live uh, quite a good standard of living. Thanks in part to, to oil, to reserves of petroleum along the coast. And this is very important in the Norwegian economy. In Hebrew, petroleum oil is neft. They have the word naftali. Neft, petroleum from God. Uh, right, right, uh, Ariel, uh, Ariel, that in Hebrew, neft means petroleum, means uh, means oil for, 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 for machines, and that Neftali and Neftali provides more of, of petroleum resources than any other country outside of the Middle East, and it's very important for them. So we also uh, incidentally, in America, the Norwegians were in the Second World War. They were quite important. They were more important than we realize. Hitler had to have 500,000 people along the North German coast and uh, also in Norway. 500,000 people permanently of the German army, permanently in effect, incapacitated, permanently in his station there. So a lot of soldiers along the North German coast because he was afraid that the Allies would invade through, through North Germany. Hitler was, uh, was quite capable of doing it, often thought about doing it. They would invade along the German coast and through Norway. And because the Norwegians could not be relied upon not to join the Allies when they did that. And the Nor they also, the Norwegians helped the, prevent the Germans uh, get the um, atomic bomb. They sabotaged, sabotaged uh, heavy water installations, and they did quite a bit in their own way. <coughs> they did quite a bit in their own way. The Norwegians were quite important. We had a, an important Norwegian in America, uh, Norman uh, Bo Bordlo, Bordlach. Bo Norman Bordlach was a scientist. He was very prominent in the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution was in the 50s, in the 60s, 70s, uh, more in the 60s. Green Revolution was a combination of American government bodies, governmental bodies, as well as NGOs, important NGOs. They paid scientists to find new ways of producing crops 
crops were, in for Asia, crops were for undeveloped countries, Mexico, Latin America, crops would be disease, resistant to crop disease, easier to harvest, resistant to rodents, and, uh, and also more bountiful, more productive. And they found them and they did a lot of, uh, introduced a lot of agricultural re re reformations, innovations. And uh, they say by virtue of that, hundreds of millions of people, an enormous number of people are now alive because of that. They would have died of starvation if it had not been for the Green Revolution. And one of the most important scientists and uh, public figures behind this was Norman uh, Bordlach, and he was uh, he was of Norwegian origin. So we have Norwegians who were quite in, uh, quite important. Uh, Norwegian. Uh, also, we have uh, Senator Jackson, who was in the, the uh, U.S. Senator, was very important in getting support for, for Israel in a time when there was was not taken for granted. He helped to get, he helped to lay the foundations for ongoing U.S. support for Israel. Also, help lay the the background, set up the background for the Jews from Russia to be let out and come to Israel, also come to America. So we had Norwegians who did a lot of good in the world and uh, were quite productive. So to the Danes, the Danes uh, in the Second World War, they refused to surrender the Jews to the Nazis. Many of them adorned this, uh, put the Star of David on their, on, their, on their arm. And the whole country got together and they took all the Jews of Norway and they put them on ships and took them across the sea into Sweden. And uh, the Swedish government agreed to look after them for the duration of the war as guests of the Swedish government on behalf of the of the Danes. So this uh, this is well known. Uh, so this is uh, something that they uh, they stood out for. Uh, and uh, these that was the Danes. The Danes are descended from Dan. They even named after Dan. They have other other groups within them also descended from Israel. And in general, in general, they are part of the of the complex of the complex of nations of the, that we identify as being sent from Israel. It includes the people of Scandinavia, also includes the Finns. The Finns had their own traditions. That the Finns in the past had, had uh, a lot of traditions that uh, recall Jewish ones. Even that they had a, a chupa, even the similar names, chupa for marriage. And they had a, and they have written about that. There is well known in Finland itself, or is not not no no well known is well, it is known, and re, and uh, researchers uh, by Finnish people have been done on this, and they're quite convincing that amongst the Finnish people there was elements from Israel. Is it the Finnish people now? There are several million, but in the past they were a, a much smaller number. They increased and multiplied from a small demographic base, similar perhaps to the Ashkenazi, to some of what experts say about the Ashkenazi, that, 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 that was a, what they call a bottleneck. And a large number of people who came down to a small number, like a large number of people, and then because of all kinds of uh, calamities or uh, changes in the world, they were reduced to a small number, like a bottle, like the neck of a bottle, and from that they expanded. So that all, and all of those expanded are related to the regional few. So the same thing happened in Sweden, in Finland, and also in other parts, also in, in Scandinavia in general. So that uh, everyone is related some, to some degree to everyone else. Uh, as we were saying, the Scandinavia is part of the, of, of the continuum, a cultural and ethnic continuum of peoples it includes those of Scandinavia, it also includes the Netherlands, the Netherlands also, the Netherlands received a lot of people from Scandinavia. A lot of the, in the past, many of the peoples now living in the Netherlands, they came from Scandinavia. Uh, also Belgium, France, the same as Switzerland and the British Isles, and the offshoots of the British Isles in the USA, Australia, America, and so on, and each of these, each and every one of these countries has its own definitions, its own cult, its own uh, uniqueness that are reflected in biblical, biblical and rabbinical analysis of, of the tribal characteristics, and also complemented and supplemented and confirmed by historical sources. The lost ten tribes, according to the Bible, would be, as we said, would be in the west, would be in the north, and the west would be facing it, associated with ships of Tarshish. The ships are, who go who travel across the Atlantic Ocean, associated with the Atlantic Ocean and other 
points. They were said to be relatively uh, blessed, agricultural plenty, mineral wealth. They were to be powerful people. They were to set an example for others. And this is what the Scandinavians have done, both in their own country and as participants in the greatness that came out of Britain and came out of the USA. Uh, and uh, just as an overall, I'd like to point out what was the point of it all. This is an overall, this is something how we understand it. What was the divine plan behind this? Why did the lost and jobs have to get lost in the first place? Okay. And what makes them different from the Jews? So how we understand it from the, the Jewish sources, from rabbinical sources, and the, also from the Bible, confirmed by the Bible, originally the lost the Israelites came out of Egypt. Israelites were one big people, and Christians multiplied in Egypt, they came out of Egypt, they went through the Red Sea, they went into the wilderness, they, went in, they received the Torah at Sinai. They came into the land of Canaan, they conquered it. And they were supposed to keep the law and become a great nation. They set up, uh, they set up the temple, and they had uh, the kingdom of David, the kingdom of Solomon, all over the Middle East, so, uh, quite a, an important country. And they were supposed to do then what the Messiah will do in the future. They were supposed to be powerful, a powerful nation to, to impose upon the Gentile peoples through example, through persuasion, also in certain cases through exercise of force, to bring all of the Gentile peoples to, to, to face, to receive the truth and the worship of the God of Israel and to abide by certain basic rulings and also to come up to Jerusalem and to, to be part of a united humanity headed by Israel. And uh, together with doing this uh, political, geopolitical, having this geopolitical task, they're also supposed to keep the Torah and to develop the Torah. The Torah needs to be developed. The Torah is there. It's, it's, uh, but you have to learn it and uh, understand it and 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 dwell into it and know it, what it wants of one to do. So they were supposed to, to perform to do both of these things together, and it was too too big for them. I, I got all over him as I say in Hebrew. It was too big for them, and the world was not ready for it, and they were not ready for the world. They couldn't do it, and there were certain inattentions. So the one providence is to say split them in half. It took the lost ten tribes and it sent them into exile. And the, the intention was this, interestingly, basing the Rabbi Cook mentions this, also Hazardim mentioned this is a found in Jewish sources concept of Mashiach ben David, who is, is also taken to represent the ten tribes in general, to go down to the level of the, of the Goyim, of the Gentiles, to go down to their level to forget, to forget who they are and uh, to come up to evolve upwards, and to bring the rest of the world with them. That was the task of the Ten Tribes. And the task of Judah was to develop the law. This is what Judah has done. This is what the Ten Tribes in their own way have done. Much of what we have today for the good and the bad, but most of the good, the world has evolved. The world is a better place than it was a few centuries ago, and from most perspective. From most, on the whole, uh, people uh, are more important. People. Uh, uh, concerned for the welfare of each other more than they were in the past. Especially the Western nations, this is mostly due to the Western nations. This is mostly due to the British, the Americans, and also the Scandinavians and the Dutch in their own way, and the Swiss in their own way, and the French in their own way. And amongst all of these peoples do we find descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. This is what the lost tribes had done, and this is what they did do to some degree. And in the future, they will have solved, will resolve their own dynamics and they will be prepared and able to rejoin with Judah and also Judah is also now developing in its own political apparatus, its own uh, political conceptions. It is also evolving towards them. And the two houses will eventually come together as we find in the, in the, in the prophecy of Ezekiel 37 and, uh, and, so, and also Isaiah chapter 11 and uh, other and also in Jeremiah 3 and 31 and in other places throughout the Bible. So do you have any questions on that? Is anyone any questions? Anyone want to? Uh, I just want to that? make a suggestion. Um, Lal, is it possible? Uh, first of all, uh, Yair, I really want to thank you so much for your outstanding presentation. It's so interesting. And I just want to show you something quite interesting. It's what you said as well. So this is a very interesting um, 
if you look over here, this is a stamp of a Jewish woman lighting Shabbos candles. And uh, here's the first day cover, which is signed from the chief rabbi. But the stamp is actually from Denmark. And it's in uh, 1984. Um, it was issued to commemorate the occasion of the 300th anniversary of the establishment of the Jewish community in Copenhagen. And the philatelic cover is autographed by the artist, uh, um, Marianne Nagler, and the chief rabbi of Copenhagen, Brent uh, Melchior. So here we have a Denmark with a Sefer Torah postmark. And here's the beautiful stamp of candles from Denmark. So what you said, it's really true. I was in uh, in temporary uh, in in um, in Finland. I don't know if you've touched on uh, about Finland as well. And I, I went with my kippah. It was a few years ago for a stamp exhibition, and I was amazed to see how people came up to me because I was wearing a kippah, and there was so many said we love Israel, and they were so, you know, because. Having where what a Yamulka, the new house is really representative at that, that exhibition. In fact, our flight, there was a, a I think a three weekly flight to Finland from Israel. They have, uh, and after the COVID, I hope it will resume, but they have many tourists from Finland, uh, Christian tourists coming to Israel, and that's how we went. When we went to Lithuania, we also took the flight to Finland first, and then we went to Riga, but from, from uh, Helsinki. But being in Helsinki as well, I walked around, my wife and I, with, with, with a yamaka, and we were very well, well, you know, we felt very uh, accepted there, because it was actually quite unbelievable. So what you say, uh, unfortunately, what's happening, and if you could touch on this as well, in in uh, Sweden, in certain areas, because of the influx of uh, so many Muslims, it's actually quite unsafe for Jews to walk around now. Uh, things have changed. So I don't know if you could touch on that as well. There's certain uh, areas in, in Sweden where it's actually very dangerous. In fact, a, a, about a week and a half ago, a non-Jew put on a kippah and he, wanted to, and he was beaten up because they thought he was Jewish. This was in Sweden. So I'm going to give over to you and then uh, we'll get to our distinguished panelists as well. But I want to thank you for your amazing insightful and very interesting uh, presentation. Leslie, apropos of uh, your uh, comment, uh, it is surprising to me that um, uh, those areas, uh, spe uh, more specific uh, Norway, I think in, in, the, uh, in today's uh, setting, uh, are uh, so anti-Semitic, uh, or at least they pass uh, um, laws that to restrict Kashrut, for example, or uh, to to restrict uh, shochetim, you know, uh, um, uh, as being uh, as being uh, anath uh, antithetical to humane treatment of, of animals, even circumcision. Can you imagine circumcision is being dis debated? Uh, but uh, so that's number one uh, that you might like to address. But I'm I'm flabbergasted that there is such a such an inquiry as to uh, uh, the lost tribes of Israel, the 10 of them, uh, uh, having a, a found a home in Scandinavia. You know, frankly, it is a, a surprise. Uh, and yet not so because there is such a thing as a movement of Nordic Israelites. Uh, you know, there, there is an interest in um, discovering that there is a connection uh, so to the extent that you advance that connection uh, through your uh, research, uh, you're welcome. You know, uh, maybe uh, uh, we are, uh, after all, connected to the, um, uh, the, uh, the future uh, uh, development of um, Anglo-Saxon law and, uh, and tolerance that uh, came along uh, through the uh, Protestant Reformation. Who knows? Um, but uh, uh, among those uh, Scandinavian uh, countries, um, I, I have a special uh, place in my heart uh, for Denmark, of course, because 95% of their Jews uh, survived because of the identity of, uh, of the population with 
the Jews as being part of the nation, part yes. and parcel of the nation. And uh, I don't know how apocryphal is the uh, legend that uh, uh, King uh, Christian X uh, rode around. Uh, of course, he, he did ride around on his horse and he was greeted uh, uh, by his subjects. And uh, the Germans were astounded that, that they, uh, they ask uh, one local resident, why he doesn't even have a, um, a uh, bodyguard? You know, can you imagine in today's right. time, he was going around without a bodyguard and he and uh, the uh, Dane uh, responded, the whole of Denmark is his bodyguard. I mean, this is astounding, wow. astounding. And it's uh, all inspiring. Um, um, uh, so 95%, as I said, of the Jews there survived by going to Sweden. So I, I give them that. I also give Sweden uh, kudos for um, uh, the martyr, uh, uh, former and late um, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. And we have a plaza name after him in uh, New York City, near right. the United Nations, for Dark Harmachol. I love that man, um, even though he was... Um, it was trying to be even-handed in the uh, in uh, the conflict uh, between the Arabs and um, and uh, and Israel. So um, I, I'm throwing all of that for your uh, very interesting coming. Of course, uh, Norway is uh, infamously connected to the Quisling um, of uh, World War II. You know, again, they, they cooperated to the fullest with uh, with the Nazis. So uh, <laughs> I have something here. Uh, yeah. The uh, year I know you have many thoughts of your own, but I just like to throw in some footnotes. The Jew hatred in Scandinavia is not too difficult to figure out. They're Lutheran countries. They got it from Martin Luther. At yes, the beginning yes, of his life, yes. Martin yes. Luther wrote his essay that Jesus was born a Jew. Yeah. The Jews at the time thought he's the new Cyrus. And not only did Martin Luther not convert Jews to his new faith, which he thought would be this kind of like Moshe Rosen Jews for Jesus of his time, uh, wow. sort of dress up Christianity in a talus and tefillin, and Jews will join my faith. That did not only did that not happen, but rabbis in Germany were converting Martin Luther's followers to Judaism, and he didn't <laughs> like that. At the end of his life, he got a little crotchety and wrote on the Jews and their lies. Mm -hmm. And Hitler said two of his favorite Christian theologians were Martin Luther and John Chrysostom. John Chrysostom is for the Eastern Church. Yeah. So it's not too difficult to figure out where even if they become secular, we discussed this before, it's in the subconscious, it's in their spiritual genetics, it's imprinted in them for hundreds of years. Having said that, uh, in each country, there was always everywhere a small, extremely pro-Nazi group. Quisling, incidentally, before he became a Quisling, people forget this, was a socialist. Look it up. And Pierre Laval was a socialist. So the question is, how did people who promoted these beautiful ideas of socialism turn like Dr. Jekyll into, and Mr. Hyde into Nazi vassal puppet rulers? I don't know the answer to the question, but it's worth looking into. So as, as Asher can tell you from Greece, in each country you had people who were either indifferent or were afraid for their lives. Not everyone's gonna be a hero. Uh, some were pro-Nazi, some were anti-Nazi. It's difficult to say in any particular country that the entire population was pro or anti. Uh, well, in the case of Albania, they were anti, and the Albanian uh, Christians and Muslims stopped their endless feuding. Asher and I were talking. Okay, let's stop the Hatfield and McCoys. We got to save the Jews. Afterwards, we'll go back to killing each other for what your grandfather, what your ancestors said 700 years ago to my ancestors. I'll kill you later. Meanwhile, let's save the Jews. Not only was every Jew in uh, every Jew in Albania, well, there weren't that many saved by their Muslim and Christian plus. neighbors, but plus. thousands came in from Macedonia and other yeah. places. And this is a story which can't be told enough, but that's on the side. So let's go back to Yair, who is our, he has this phenomenal knowledge of, uh, well, let's put it this way. Until Elijah and Mashi Mashiach ben David will be here, none of us knows for sure. But if I were asked who I would like to have as my relatives, I'd have no objection to uh, the Danes, the Swedes, the Norwegians, 
than the Finns. I can think of worse relatives. I think they do a lot of good for Israel if we could use a few hundred thousand of them here. Uh, they have master traditions in craftsmanship and, and ma many tremendous skills in so many different areas. Uh, but that let me not get off to the side. I just wanted to mention about the Jew hatred that one finds in these countries and people who on the surface may seem to, well, you're secular, but you're not. And as another footnote, Ingmar Bergman, the director was a big Nazi. He never re recanted it, even a phony recant. And the founders of IKEA were big Nazi supporters. That's a fact they don't want, uh, they try to keep hidden. So uh, yes, the, the Third Reich had its uh, very active supporters all over the place. But let's hand it over to Yair. I just wanted to throw in about Martin Luther. Oh, one more point regarding moving places. If you think that Martin Luther and his the, his uh, mentor, when he was still a priest, walked all the way to Rome, people moved. It's not that far. I mean, I never tried it. If you would walk from uh, northern Assyria to Scandinavia, how long would it take? I don't know, a couple of months. But, you know, people, historically, peoples have there been tremendous migration. So what would be so strange about the idea that people from uh, northern uh, Eastern Turkey, northern Iraq, northern Iran would move anywhere, whether east to Japan and China or into Southeast Asia or into southern Russia and then up the rivers to Scandinavia. It's not, the world's not that big, actually. If you walk long enough, you'll get, get on a boat, you'll, like the Polynesians and their boats going all over the Pacific, you'll get somewhere. So in terms of the logistics of moving over the Bosporus, you know, like John Holly wrote that essay that the Sambatian is the Bosporus and explained why and going north into Europe. Logistically isn't such a big deal, is it? That's all I wanted to say. Now I'm gonna mute my mic here. <laughs> okay, uh, so concerning anti-Semitism, this is true. The, first of all, the, the Scandinavians have a humanitarian outlook. They look after uh, refugees. They take in Muslims. They're, they're like a, a lot of left-wing people sometimes who have a problem in Israel itself. They have left-wing people who are more concerned with the Arabs than they are with the Jews. And they're more concerned with Arab rights than they are with Jewish rights. This is a phenomenon that is known. It's known in Israel. It's known in America and apparently it's also down in Scandinavia. And the Scandinavians traditionally have had this humanitarian, humanistic outlook, uh, left of center, left wing inclined, uh, wishy-washy, lovey-dovey type of personality. And this is uh, this has been a source of strength for them. It's not always negative. Uh, in addition to that, we also find amongst the lost in we find the elements from the Canaan, descendants from Canaan also were there. Also, Canaanites came in with them. They were intermixed with them. Also, still men and myself. Also, Edomites amongst them. These people are not always negative. In some cases, they have a positive contribution to give. Uh, for instance, it says uh, in the Talmud, it says that no war can be won without the participation of Bnei Adam, with their descendants of Esau, leading the troops, so giving, uh, providing their, supplying their martial qualities. We need them for certain reasons. We need everyone or everyone can find their place, but they also have indica stronger indications than others to be against the Israelites, to be against the Jews. The Jews epitomize the rule of law, believing in God and uh, living a, a moral life. The people who do not want that, do not live that life are uh, instinctively against it. Or people who set up their own gods, such as the Muslims do and the Christians to some degree do, also do they, they are against the Jews for representing the truth of the biblical truth. And they all, everyone has their own complexes and their own, uh, their own indications. Also, it should be noted that the Lost Ten Tribes were exiled. They were exiled according to the Bible in 2 Kings 17 and 2 Kings 18 because they went in the ways of the nations around them. They intermixed with the Canaanites. So they, they worshipped the Baal, they worshipped Asherah. And incidentally, this Canaanite type of religion, we find it later in the Scandinavia, almost under the same name. And uh, in the same type of, of uh, outlooks, mm. the same goddesses are found in ancient Scandinavia, as were, as were known the Canaanites, and the Israelites were exiled for 
for going in the way of these people, for adopting their, their, their customs. And also the Israelites themselves had stopped, according to the Midrash, uh, keeping their circumcision. They had been against it. So, and so we find this. Find but again, that, uh, th there was a time when uh, Jews uh, voluntarily ceased to circumcise their sons? There are, I, I come from Australia. I heard of assimilated Jews who were not circumcising their children. It might be a very small percentage. Uh, traditionally, every Jew, no matter how, 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 Hiloni, how, how secular he might be, he, certain things they always did, including circumcision. Right. But, it, but, but, no, the phenomenon existed of Jews, reformed Jews not circumcising the children, circumcision was not kept by all Jews throughout history. Is that right? This is news. To but, me. Uh, I thought that even and, the reform are united in that. Even agnostics, uh, even atheist Jews. I know I encounter atheists because they are, they say we are Jewish by culture. You know, coach, they still observe the tenet of circumcision. And now you're telling me that there may be uh, a tiny fraction of Jews in the world who just do not abide by that. So, the, so historically and also uh, uh, in contemporary reality, the are Jews who do not circumcise their children, yeah. even though there's a small, uh, uh, but they exist. Yeah, you, can just I, can I mention something? Talk about, hmm. but, but, uh, yeah. uh, this is taking away what we're saying to some degree. So in other words, you always find Anti-Semitism through everywhere we find the Los Angeles also find anti-Semitic elements. You find follow Jewish, pro-Jewish people, elements, groups, people who instinctively on the whole are uh, for the Jews, identify with the Jews, and also find people in the opposite direction. And so we uh, you have to take things into consideration, look at the cultural and the historical context. Uh, sometime in the past things were different, things were people it was much harder for Jews. Incidentally, I know that in the Shoah, there were people, survivors of the Shoah, did not want their children to circumcise their children. It's, it's even a case in, in Haifa, because, because they were afraid that, the, 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 God forbid, the anti-Semites might return. And it would be important to be able to hide your Judaism. Okay. I, I, uh, yeah, here, can, I, can I say something on this? Yes, um, just to, I should, to put you in the picture. Uh, unfortunately, we have um, a distant family member where the the son uh, in 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 our family, my wife and our family, where the son unfortunately married out, and um, it was very difficult for his mother and for the the family to accept it, but they accepted it until he had twins, and the one was a boy and one was a girl, and the uh, his wife, the the son's wife, said she promises that you know she'll allow to have a circumcision. When the time came for the circumcision, she refused. And I must tell you that more than anything else has upset the family because it's it's really the total break. That's the breach, the, the covenant. And yeah. you see, and you actually see it, but unfortunately you realize that that part of the family is going to be lost to, to Yiddishkeit forever. And and not having their son um, have so, a breast uh, upset the mother, because unfortunately the father had passed away, but it upset her more than anything else. It's so, so it's ironic. Unfortunately, it's real. It's it's a real tragedy, but it's unfortunately Israel. And Rav, what, what you say about after the Shah, because that's during the Shah, when I've interviewed of quite a few Holocaust survivors and with the boys, some going wouldn't take children if they were boys because they knew that the, they mm. could come and have a look uh, if they're Jewish or not. That would identify... That's the most, you know, to identify if you're Jewish or not. So they, they would take sometimes the girls, but not the boys. So it, it resonates. Paradoxically, uh, a circumcision has become so popular in general. Gentiles circumcise automatically their kids in, uh, in the hospital before their return. Uh, and in my case, uh, because of the very unique uh, way that I was born in a cave, during the occupation in Greece, instead of having my circumcision in eight days, I, I learned later, of course, I had it in eight months after the liberation of the, of the country. Uh, uh, 
back to the Greek situation, Greeks make it a point. Uh, of course, their anti-Semitism is well known, but make it a point to say that they are they are perfect because they uh, insist religiously and otherwise not to circumcise under any circumstances. And there have been cases in New York of uh, Greek families, uh, one family that became a court celebr that took uh, the the hospital and the doctor to court because they did it automatically. And uh, they said, no, we insist on uh, no, circum no circumcision. Okay. Uh, uh, in, you know, Australia and, in Australia and uh, in the USA, the majority the USA, of people, the, majority of the citizens, especially those of Anglo-Saxon origin, are circumcised. Yeah. In Britain, and, they uh, don't do it so much because the doctors are, are not used to it. They don't want to do it and it costs money. You have to, it's not on the national health. But it's for health. So, and every, every country is, is different. But, uh, and it is. Any country that is against circumcision in general, which, could, is, and which is prejudicial to Jews, is, is anti-Semitic. And, uh, and that is one of our scientific every country, even people are anti-Semitic with certain criteria. If anti-Semitism is, is a recurring, element in, in the national ethos, we consider them to be unlikely to be the center of, of Israel. It counts against them. But there are other factors that outweigh this. Uh, also, in the most, uh, in Scandinavia, you have a phenomenon of Christianity. The most of Scandinavia are Lutherans. And uh, Luther had both uh, pro-Jewish and anti-Jewish elements in the Lutheran religion. Luther, towards the end of his life, we had a daily uh, conversations with the devil. He went crazy. He also wrote about the, against the Jews. Uh, and uh, we fought throughout in Germany. The case was that the more Lutheran, the more Lutheran, the more religious the Lutherans were, the more anti-Semitism were. were. The, 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 the power base of the Nazi party was in Lutheran areas, even though many of the Nazis were themselves living Nazis were Catholic. Their power base was in Lutheran areas because where there people were more Lutheran in Germany, they were more anti-Semitic. Whereas in Scandinavia, where people were more religious and it's Lutheran, more, believe more in the Bible, there they tended to be more pro-Jewish. Oh. And so too, in, uh, in America, sense of Scandinavians in the USA, the more religious they are, the more pro-Jewish, the more closer they feel to, to Israel. So we see the same the element of Christianity is like a catalyst. Uh, Christianity serves as a catalyst to draw in some cases, to draw those of Israelite descent closer to the Israelite, closer to their source, and for those who are not of Israelite descent, to distance them. Okay. Can I mention something? I think you might find this a little interesting. I went to see a Holocaust survivor, and um, he was actually one of the children that was liberated in Auschwitz. And as I went to see into his home, he said to me, he saw that I was with the kippah, and he said to me, you know, I never believed in Hashem after the Shoah, but now I do. I said, well, how come? And he told me the most phenomenal story. Mm. His daughter actually married um, a German and went to Germany. She's an opera singer. And he said afterwards with my children, I let them be free because I was, I had such a restrictive life. And they had a son and a daughter and her daughter's husband wouldn't allow this son to be circumcised. And it actually did upset him, this Holocaust survivor. Anyway, what happened is that um, he said, I really believe that there's God because when he was 12 years old, he was having difficulty going to the toilet to make like a pipi. He couldn't. He was having great difficulty. And the doctor in Germany said to him, well, to, to the, the parents, he has to have a circumcision. And he had the circumcision at the age of 12. And he felt after that, suddenly he reconnected with Jewish friends and he later had a bar mitzvah. And this Holocaust survivor said to me, I know there's a God because when that happened, I started believing in Hashem again. It's amazing. His name's Tommy Shrem. He lives here in Israel. 
He was one of the the, the few children that was the, the very famous picture of the children that were um, liberated from Auschwitz. And I went to see him and he told me the story on video. And it really is actually quite amazing. And I just want to mention that in South Africa, a lot of the black um, mm-hmm. the black tribes, like the Zulus, right. and they do the circumcision and they have a whole process where they do it, where they they, they go out into the, the fields and they do it, and unfortunately, quite a few of them die because it's done like so in the rural areas. But I attended once a circumcision that has to be done in Baraguanath Hospital, it's the main hospital. And the non Jewish doctor said to me, I couldn't believe it, but he said to me, because he knew I was Jewish, I had a Yamakan under my scrub cap. He said to me, Your God's very clever. And I said to him, But he's your God as well. But anyway, he said, I said, Why? He said, Because on the eighth day, it's scientifically and medically proven. If ever you have to do a circumcision, it's the best time to do it. The the blood vessels, they start to clot, the pain, everything. If you want to choose one day in a boy's life to do the circumcision, the eighth day is the best day to do it. And it was, I know we're off the topic, but it was so heartwarming hearing this coming from a top professor in Baraguanath in South Africa, saying how he's impressed that, my God, you win the best day to to do the circumcision. I I would like to add something at this point to the conversation of the sages here, and I mean that literally. Uh, The fact that people, Jews, Israelites get lost, nothing's ever really lost. I'll give you an example. When I came to Israel in 1978 after finishing college, I spent four months on Kibbutz Shluchot, which is in the Jordan Valley, right south of Beit Shan. There are a number of uh, kibbutzim there, Ste Eliyahu, Tirat Zvi. And on the kibbutz was a young man. He's now Rabbi Nisan Ben Avraham. I have to check. I think we've been friends on Facebook. We should invite him to speak. His family had 500 years earlier become Catholics, and they did not practice secretly as Moranos conversos, B'nai They really converted and wanted to hide everything, and they became very aristocratic and wealthy Spaniards. Somehow, he found, I don't know how, he said, wait a minute. He found out that if he went back 500 years, there was the Jews in the family. He decided to look into this. He was disowned by his family. It wasn't like grandma lit candles behind curtains. What? No, don't, no, absolutely not. He came to Israel. He converted al pi halacha and became a real rabbi as he is today. I haven't spoken to Nissan. Is that, I have to check. I have it written down. We have so many people to invite to speak, I have, especially if they're older people. I want to get them while they're still here without having to have Sir Arthur Conan Doyle arrange a seance. And uh, he, out of nowhere, with no one's, the uncle said, well, you know, he, I, he just, it, a, a spark lit in his soul after five hundred years and I don't even know if this family speaks to him today so uh, the fact for example as Asher and I just discussed with uh, you, you had to go less with Dr. Katz about this, the assimilation rate and I agree with Asher Yeshiva study and I agree with Dr. Katz uh, history studies even if someone gets lost in the end, with the conservation of energy in the universe, nothing energy can ban transform matter, but nothing's really lost. If Hashem wants to regenerate the living and resurrect the dead, as our prophecies say he will, he will do it. If he wants to bring us back from the ends of the earth and the end of time, he will do it. And he is doing it. And then there are the, these astonishing stories about big anti-Semites like that, that guy in Hungary is... Asher will know this better than me, the leader of one of these, the Jobbik party, the Nazi party, and he's gung-ho, and he's the Jews this and the Jews that. One day goes to visit his grandmother, and she sews him the tattoo. And he has a crisis. He could have swept it under the rug, but he didn't. He came out, he said, I'm a Jew. 
and he left the party and he became a chassid or something. And my son-in-law from Poland talked about uh, a brother and a sister who were in Poland busy, real skinhead Nazis, uh, swastikas on Jewish graves, knocking them over, vandalizing the synagogues, the same thing. Grandma or grandpa was a Jew at Auschwitz or something like that. Now they're Hasidim. Now, there are times that doesn't happen and or people have a very bad reaction to Jewish or partial Jewish ancestry, whereas it says in Isaiah chapter 50, your destroyers will come forth from among you. I'll give you a simple example. Who destroyed the temple? It, it, something, I, Tiberius. We have a city named, how can we have a city named after Tiberius? His uncle was Philo, the Moses Mendelssohn of his time. And he was worse than the Goyish to other. He had to show he's more Goyish than the Goyish. So uh, with Vespasian, Tiberius was actually the one who handled destroying the temple. And he was pretty brutal even by Roman standards. He came from an upper class assimilated Jewish family, but again, Philo was considered, and he's, uh, he's respected by Christian and Muslim theologians and philosophers till today as a great mind. I would, I would say Moses Mendelssohn is an unfair comparison. He was more like the Samson Raphael Hirsch of his day, combining Rabbi Dr. Samson Raphael Hirsch, who was a member of the parliament in whatever state he was in Germany at the time, symbolized that, that the synthesis the way it's supposed to be, and yet his nephew who went into the army was the general who destroyed the temple. So we have that problem too, plaguing us throughout history, but no one's ever lost. You never know when they can come back like uh, Nazis whose kids have become very friendly to uh, Jews in Israel and or in some cases converted. Uh, the, there, are, no one's, all I wanted to say, I'm saying in a very long winded way is when people get lost and people are getting lost all the time, no one's ever lost forever. Who knows? And then I have to ask Yair, if one were to estimate the world 12 tribes population, if it includes the Pashtun and the Anglo-Celts and the Scandinavians, what are we talking about, 500 million people? That's a question, not a statement. I have no idea. I hand that over to Yair, who now that John Hulley is gone, Yair is probably, I mean, yes, there's Shalva Weil and there's Harry Rosenberg and others, but in terms of his prolific output of, output of research and, and scholarship, I don't know anyone else out there at the moment. And Rabbi Eliyahu Avichail is gone, but he was very focused in certain areas in his Lost Tribes research. I don't know anyone out there anymore who has the kind of breadth of research that Yair does. So my question then is, okay, no one's ever lost. And how many Israelites are we talking about? So, uh, I can't, we cannot say. We don't, we cannot point, the thing is we cannot point, we cannot point to any individual and say, he, this person is definitely a descendant from Israel. So each and every one of them, uh, also according to the Zohar, according to the Talmud Yerushalmi, Sanhedrin, when the Lost End tribes return, they will convert, they will accept that this is similar, I imagine, similar to how they treated the Ethiopians, the Ethiopian Jews when they returned, that because of the different problems in declaring and determining the Judaism and or in other, for other reasons, they declared them to be non-Jewish and they uh, obliged them to, to carry out what's called a Hidusha bridge, renewal of the covenant. A renewal of the covenant is acceptable, uh, and it is not demeaning. It's not that people. It's not it's not saying these people are not definitely not from Israel. We're just saying we want them to renew the covenant because of uh, different so because of whatever the circumstances are to remove all suffering, and it's better for them. In effect, logically, this is the same as conversion. And so, this when the lost ten tribes return, we don't know how they will return. We don't know what will happen. The sources indicate that we'll convert with a, and so we can leave it as that, leave it as something for, uh, for to be solved in the future. And, uh, and, and, and so this is the reality. The number of Israelites uh, could be 300 million, it could be much more. 
This was part of the prophecies. This was the prophecy that was given to Abraham, was given to uh, Rabbah. You will be hundreds of millions according to one understanding of the blessing to, to Abraham. His, his seed would number hundreds of millions. And they would fill up the earth, it would be as, as, as the sand of the sea, as the stars of the heaven, as the dust of the earth. There would be immensely, an immense number of people. And they would be geographically, in the universal terms, uh, of a significant. So it could be hundreds of millions of people of Israelite descent and they will return. Or it could be much less. Uh, so if we look at the reality, the reality we... Well, geogra geographical reality, we have the Jewish people. The Jewish people descended or represent the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. They were the tribes who formed the kingdom or the core element of the Jewish, or the tribe of Judah. And they, so they represent three tribes. And uh, we have uh, eight million or six, seven million uh, Jews in the land of Israel today, about another seven million or less all over the earth. So we have 14 million from three tribes that we know about. And the Jews, uh, we could say that the Jews uh, went through a holocaust, they just went through persecution to become a Jew requires a sacrifice. Uh, so you should say that you cannot make a comparison to the Jewish people. But at the same time, everywhere else, everywhere else had problems. You had the Black Death, you had famines, you had disasters that occurred in the past that seriously reduced the, the world population. And in many cases, the Jews. They suffered less. The Jews also suffered along with their neighbors. In many cases, the Jews suffered less, possibly because of uh, a bit of hygiene, or even circumcision could have been a factor. It, gives, uh, it, it inoculates a person from certain diseases, from certain problems, whatever the case. Uh, whatever the case, the Jews often survived better than the Gentiles did throughout their history. Uh, so we have a uh, three. Uh, so we have, uh, we have three tribes. Three tribes give us about four million per tribe. We also have the tribes in Scandinavia. We have uh, about uh, in uh, in Sweden ten million. In Norway about four or five million. In Denmark about the same. Finland about the same. So they they, they compared the tribe to tribe. It's similar to what the Jews have. Each of these different tribes. In uh, France, they have a much larger population. In the Netherlands, a much larger population, and it was then you have the USA, where we also find the lost tribes of Israel, the USA, and 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 uh, and also the British, the offshoot to of the British, but those people they could come in may be considered to be as well as uh, representing individual tribes of Joseph. They may also be con be considered as representing an amalgamation of all of the tribes together. Uh, so we have other possibilities that the, the, the lost tribes of Israel that we identify as Israelites number hundreds of millions, maybe to a great, a much, much more, maybe a little less, we don't know, but the, the, the possibility is there. The possibility is there in, in, in the prophecy and, the, and also in reality. The ge geographical, the demographic uh, reality indicates that it, it is possible. It's not a far-pitched estimation. I'd uh, like to add one other point, Asher. Uh, it's a very short point. Uh, the issue of Kashrut, the Jew haters, the anti-Semites, always go after this and say it's savage and barbaric. Uh, Dr. Temple Grandin, who is uh, famous for uh, redesigning over 50% of the slaughterhouses in the United States to be humane and compassionate to animals was the subject in 10 years ago, the movie with Claire Dane Temple and is world renowned and respected as an animal because she's on the, supposedly, she, because she's on the autistic spectrum with high function autism, Asperger's, it, 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 there's an idea that it might give such people uh, more intuitive understanding of animals in the animal world. Well, I'm on that spectrum too, is it true? Uh, she makes a good case for it in her books. And she specifically says, this is all crap. She said, that's my field. I'm much happier talking to horses than I'm the people. And I redesigned the slaughterhouses because I can't change the fact that people eat meat, but at least I can design them so it's less frightening to the cows before they get slaughtered. She said, I can 
and she has a doctorate in animal husbandry and teaches at the University of Colorado in Fort Collins. And she said, anyone who talks like this doesn't know what they're talking about. The most humane, if it's done right, if it's done right, and that's very, you, you, if it's done wrong, I feel sorry for the, the chicken or the goat or the cow. But if it's done right, she said, it is the most humane form of slaughter. And I have to, you know what? I'm going to find, I have to really publish that in her books because the Jew haters constantly go after this and say, oh, look how cruel and vicious the Jews are to animals with kosher slaughter. They, they, they constantly, and in fact, this is something I'm going to be talking about is the new Nazis, not white supremacists, the new Nazis who masquerade as patriots uh, who are in effect the recycled Senator Burton Wheelers and Father Coughlin's and Henry Ford's and Charles Lindbergh's. I say specifically the new Nazis, not to throw around the, well, you're a Nazi or, well, you're an anti-Semite. I, I will itemize why I say that in other programs. This is one of their points. Ah, you see the Jews are so cruel and brutal to, they have a whole list on their menu. Animals, kashrut. Uh, kosher slaughter. This they always go after this point. They pretend they're concerned with the welfare of animals. These are the same people who advocate euthanasia, the medical murder of the very old, the very young, mentally and physically handicapped people. But as uh, in uh, Alice in Wonderland, what is uh, one of the points? The Queen could say six impossible things before breakfast, and someone else said logical consistency is the bugaboo of small minds. So Temple Grandin says that is absolute BS. Now, her credentials are on Mount Olympus. I make a note to find where she says that so we can publish it. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Now over to Professor the, the, the The fur trade is being circumscribed in, uh, in, uh, in Israel too, uh, by the way. Uh, but apropos to Lowe's earlier, much earlier comment about uh, the short distance from uh, uh, Mesopotamia to uh, points north in Scandinavia. Uh, I'd be interested uh, I hear from your perspective, uh, closer to home. This is in Bundy Beach. Can you see this? What? This is what was the last point? I didn't understand. Bundy, Bundy Beach in in New South uh, Wales, uh, Australia. Yes? Yes, yeah, so- What about it? I, I, I'm interested to uh, uh, how, um, uh, why is there such a rise of anti-Semitism so far from uh, the, the natural habitat of, of Europe, if you will, or, or, the, or, the, or the Arab uh, Middle East, you know, uh, and, and then, whether any of our tribes uh, have uh, ever found any home in such far-flung place like uh, uh, New Zealand and uh, Australia. What's your take on that? Uh, New, the population of New Zealand and Australia is overwhelmingly from the British Isles. They were the people who founded the country and they are uh, still comprise the majority of the population. There might be 50, 60, 70% of the population. They're not everyone is from that region, but they are the majority. And uh, another important minority are also from other parts of Europe. whom we also, we also, we also understand that people from Europe, who, who, not from the Western tribe countries, but people from Europe who migrate to them, to those areas. In some cases, we we'll also be sort of descent. For instance, in Germany, we find that many of the Germans in the 1870s, 1880s, who went to the USA, were different from those who stayed behind. And also, there's something similar happened in England, happened in other areas. The people who migrated are different from those who stayed behind. In some cases, you had one village, one beside the other. All the people from one village get up and leave. All the people from another village stayed behind. And um, it happened throughout Europe, these cases, and often the, there were tests done, and it was the age of uh, physical, uh, uh, anthro physical anthropology, and they even found physical differences so between those who went to America and those who stayed behind, as if 
they were different in in England. You had a similar phenomenon between uh, those who went to America and those who stayed in England, and they had often belonged to different social classes, different groups. Had always been different, in other words. People who somehow or other felt different from their neighbours and stayed together. Had always considered themselves so different. And they picked themselves up and left, not always because of economic reasons, for reasons that even the German authorities that have marked upon could not find explanations for, and they were driven by an unseen force to get out and go. And they, this is what they did. They came to America, and in America, some of them were anti, a lot of them were anti-Semites. It's the base of American anti-Semitism to found amongst German Americans. But it is not over, it's not an overwhelming phenomenon there. It only pertains to a minority. Most German Americans have been supporters of Israel. And even now, the evangelical movement, a good portion of those people are descended from German Americans. In other words, they are different from the Germans who stayed behind because we see here uh, people from Israel who had, who, who had remained. When we describe them in our history, in history, chasing lost in tribes through Europe. We find that they, they pass through Germany, they pass through Greece, they pass through the Balkan areas, they pass through a lot of a good portion of Europe, and they kept on going. But here and there, they, the pockets of them remained, and often the pockets of them remained. They remained in their own village, their own areas, and ultimately their descendants also left those regions and went to uh, re uh, areas such as the USA, such as Britain, such as Australia, and so on, that have been found by the central of tribes of Israel. But, uh, and nevertheless, in all those regions, you find descendants, you find anti Semites. You find anti Semites, or you find people who, 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 who at one stage were pro Jewish and then turned against the Jews. And you find the opposite people who were anti Jewish in the beginning and then became pro Jewish. Uh, or people whose fathers were anti-Semitic, uh, they became pro-Jewish or just the opposite. Yeah. This is a known phenomenon. We even find the descendants of Jews. Jews themselves will become anti-Semitic. But, uh, but we, we take everything on the whole. We take it generally to use a scientific approach and the law of averages, what the overwhelming majority does, the overwhelming impression it gives us. That's what we take as being the decisive factor. And then, so in Australia, you have any semites. You have quite a lot of any semites, especially amongst people from Europe, from Central Europe, from or from the Balkans, from the Ukraine, from uh, countries like that, countries that had uh, more anti-Semitism than than other part portions. So, to their descendants who come to East Australia are like that, even though a lot of them are different, different from the areas from the people from areas they came from, and they too, in many cases, also become identified with the Australian people and. And the more they identify, the more pro-Jewish or pro-Israel they are. Uh, and uh, uh, but if you still have any semitic phenomenon, I don't know what you're talking about on Bondi Beach in New South Wales, or uh, some, something anti there were any semitic incidents, and you also did have any semitic incidents in Australia. I was in Australia, and you do have any semites there. But most of the people uh, don't care very much one way or the other, and those that do. Those that do tend to be pro-Jewish or tend to be pro uh, for in favor of the state, uh, in favor of the state of Israel. That beckons uh, the the final question with, uh, connected to Australia, and that is uh, uh, the relations uh, with the Aborigines uh, between Jews and them. Uh, they presumably were not born with anti-Semitic uh, sentiments. Uh, are they uh, prone to understand the minority that we are in the world and in in Australia and in uh, the Middle East and how we survive or we we fight to survive as as a people? So first of all, uh, first of all, we have the we have also surprise surprise. We have a certain Gentiles who never heard of a Jew, don't know what a Jew is. Okay, yeah. so the, you have a, not only amongst primitive people, even in Australia, you have people like that, even amongst white people, you have people like that who never really thought about it, never really gave it serious thought. So, that too, that is a, a too, is something that we come across. Uh, I came across uh, Australian Aborigines who are, who are anti Jewish uh, because, uh, the, because of them, because they are helped by left-wing elements, left-wing elements go to them, help them, stand up for them, uh, fight for them, uh, struggle for, for, their, for their rights, for, to, for them, 
to prevent them from being exploited or discriminated against. So they look up to them, and these left-wing people are, in many cases, anti-Semitic or against the state of Israel. So the Aborigines, I come across Aborigines who also adopted that, that type of, uh, or that way of thought. Um, I, uh, 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 listen, I was in the university when they're having a, it was a, a students. The students in, in the, with the University of Wars were having a, a demonstration against Israel in favor of the Palestinians. Most students were in that university were actually pro-Jewish, but they also had a strong left-wing uh, group there who were against, against Zionism, against uh, the state of Israel. And uh, in a roundabout way, also against the Jewish people. So there were, uh, when they were having this demonstration, a few uh, Aborigines there. I don't exactly know what the Aborigines were doing there, so I went up and started talking to them. And I understood that someone had brought them there. They didn't really care what the whole thing was about. If everyone's against the, the Jews, they join in. There's also a phenomenon we find it amongst everyone. We also find it more amongst the Gentiles than amongst Jews. So if everyone dislikes a certain group or dislikes a certain person, we also find that in school. We grew up in school, so children get, get into that. that a, one of the boys, one of the girls, is something different about them, dislikable. Everyone dislikes them because that's a dumb thing. And uh, without any rational explanation for it, it's just, uh, something happened. So, so to this group, this, uh, this group mentality also exists. So they, they had come there because someone had brought them there and they didn't like Jews or they didn't like anyone. There was uh, some, there's one, one, there's another person there actually looks a little bit like an Aborigine. I thought he was one of them because he was with them. Uh, so I came up and I said, oh, I started talking to him and it turned out he wasn't an Aborigine, Abr he was Irish, he was one of the dark uh, type of Irish types. And he says that he himself um, is against the Jews because the Jews identify. He doesn't like people identifying. Uh, he's, uh, he doesn't like people sta standing out or separating themselves from others. So that was the rationale that he gave for disliking the Jews and being against the state of Israel. And the Aborigines who were there, they, 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 they seemed to agree with what he was saying. But that doesn't say anything because they were liable to agree with what anyone said as, uh, according to the way it was being said, not or who was saying it rather than the substance of what was spoken. Thank you. Uh, so the average, in other words, the Aborigines don't, you should not look for, average, uh, for uh, any welcome news from uh, primitive peoples. They're just as worse, as bad as others. They're even worse than them. In some cases, we, uh, Israel has been helped because, uh, because a certain islanders is, uh, have represented representation in, in the UN. I've spoken out on behalf of the state of Israel. When you get down to it, this is because it was a, a missionary, a miss an English missionary or an, a, an American missionary, an Anglo-Saxon missionary came there and told them that the Jews are the chosen people, and uh, also told them, uh, gave them what they considered to be salvation. So they associate the Jews with salvation, with this giving of salvation, and therefore they are pro-Jewish. But the, the, ins the person who inspired them to think along this direction was, was someone who we identify as descended from the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, and, uh, and we find that everywhere. Everywhere, any other group which has been where it has been claimed that they are from lost tribes of Israel, they are usually anti-Semitic. And even even amongst people in England who claim to be British Israel, for instance, have a group in Eng in, in in England who actually some of them are friends of mine. I they sell my books. I correspond with them. Some of them are very nice people. And historically, important. British personalities came from them and helped the Jewish people, and helped the state of Israel. Or Wingate came, came out of them. Uh, Mainzer Hagen came out of them. The, the person, the um, Patterson, who led the founder of the Jewish Legion, important people were brought up in the, uh, with the ideas of British Israel and kept them all their lives and they uh, became champions of the Jewish people. So you have people from amongst this group who uh, have been pro Jewish and it is also inspired them to be pro Jewish. But you have others who have been, uh, for some reason, going the opposite direction and use what they've been taught for, as an excuse to be anti-Semitic and say, we are the true Jews and the Jews are impostors, the Jews are from the Khuzars, the Jews are from somewhere else. The Jews, uh, the Jews are on the opposite side and we are not part of them. 
so the, we have to, this is the reality this is uh is what we are faced with and be, and because of the, the these people who are anti-semitic it is often hard for us to get our voice to to be trying to say what we have to say and uh the jews who have encountered this it's anti-semitic aspect of such uh advocates of such people uh are prejudiced against it and they don't really want to listen to us because of this uh, uh, yeah, uh, Rav, I think uh, the time is very late. We've been on for nearly two hours. <laughs> it's been absolutely amazing, and I think we need to have you back again. It's been extremely informative, and uh, we really want to thank you. And I just want to mention that, um, you know, what your organization does, uh, the Brit, um, it's so important. And our listeners out there who are going to be watching this, I would advise you to go to HebrewNations.com you can see your whole history and I've just been going through the history and what a small world that Rabbi felt as she lives in the same street as me across the road from me. I mean, this is such a small world and Tamar Yona, who Lal knows as well, very well. And I've been on her show. Uh, it's such a small world, but uh, mm-hmm. for the greater world and the greater, those watching from all over in the small global village of ours, um, the, the history of uh, this very important organization, Brit, um, which combines Jews and non-Jews into understanding the history of the 10 lost tribes. I think uh, I could spend really literally hours discussing what you've achieved and it's all on the, the internet on your amazing site that you have. So I would recommend our, our viewers there to go on to hebrewnations.com or just Google Brit um, history and you'll see such a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, organization and the work that you've done and what you've achieved and that you still will achieve. And the negativity and the anti-Semitism from all these you know, people that you've been speaking about, hopefully they'll be watching this and they will realize that they are part of Am Israel. And please God, with the coming of Mashiach, and uh, we'll be all reunited back in, in Israel and with Hashem. Uh, is what in the time of the Mashiach. So I want to really thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to have you on. And Rav, you, you know, coming from Australia, um, no worries. I don't know, Australia, when you go to Australia, it's incredible. It's, I've been there once with my daughter and the, 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 the most famous statement that I heard so many people saying, no worries, because that's a Don't country worry. where there really aren't too many worries. <laughs> but, but it really is a special place, and, uh, and we are very fortunate to have you here in Yerushalayim, and we want to just encourage you to continue in the good work that you do. And uh, Lowell, it would be wonderful if uh, we could have Rav Davidi again on, on, on our show, because there's so much to talk about, and it's been absolutely phenomenal hearing you this evening. So we want to wish you and everybody a, uh, a Shabbat Shalom and just Shabbat all the very best. Lowell, thank you so much for organizing this. Prof. Asher, we want to thank you for your always your tremendous input that you give. Thank you. It's, it's thank also you. such a, it's good to have you as well. And uh, Rav Yad, Ravadi, really, thank you very, very much. It's been wonderful hearing you and you've, you've just enlightened us with such interesting and important facts. So thank Hello. you very much. Just a, uh, a uh, housekeeping uh, detail. I have the master <laughs> calendar dates for uh, Iron uh, uh, Root and Branch <laughs> Association. Uh, the next one I have down formally is uh, July 5th. Is that, is that correct? Uh, do we have anything in the foreseeable future? We have uh, almost every evening between That's now and then. I, I just have so much that it's, uh, t- I'm a little bit uh, holding on to my old coattails, trying to get out the Zoom links and okay. the Facebook events announcement. Okay. Uh, that's a nice problem to have, yes. Yes, I'll wait, you know, uh, again, I will adjust uh, immediately. Uh, by the way, my my Escher High is leaving on Tuesday, so I'll be a bachelor for two months as she uh, drive her to uh, Kennedy Airport to be with her 97-year-old mom in, in Greece. So uh, I would be even <laughs> more available. <laughs> And, and Rob, will you be available for future talks as well? Of, of course.
course. You'll yes. be able to. Uh, we, we have. And, and right. Rabbi Davidi, you, you'll also be available. That's why I have down. Uh, right. July 5th is my next uh, talk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's All Monday. the very best. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Les, Lowell, Yair, Mazatov. Really appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. Light it up. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Ravier, we look forward to seeing you again. All the best. Thank you.